Hello, 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 my friend. Welcome to the Remember to Live podcast. I'm so excited to be here. I cannot wait to get into it. I can't wait. I can't wait. I cannot wait to share Dr. Gaz with the world because you add so much to my life. And like every conversation we have, I think could be a podcast. So I'm excited to really get into it today. And you have the pleasure of being my first guest with my new vision in kind of the expanded vision that I have and where I want to go with this platform. So you get to be the first one yeah. to answer <laughs> to answer my kickoff questions. Let's do it. And so I'm those ready. questions are, what does it mean to live a life and what makes it good? Oh. What does it mean to live a life? You know, what comes to my mind, the first thing that comes to my mind is this memory I have of when I was in my senior year of college, um, which I would say was like the height of my perfectionist performer, do it for the glory and for what you've been told. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't get more peak than that. And I'm rushing around campus from one place to another for a test and a you know, and at that time I was studying to be a medical doctor. So, you know, organic chemistry and all that just stuff that I was carrying around in my head. And I remember it was a sunny spring day and I just happened to glance over at a bush as I was going by and there was this most unusual butterfly. <laughs> and oh. I don't know what, because this was not me at the time at all. Mm -hmm. For me these days, but I just remember like there was a physical, my body just went er and turned towards that bush. And it was like all time stopped. And it was just me and this creature and this moment. And suddenly I could hear all the sounds and I could feel the sun on me. And, and all that rush, all that anxiety, all that preparation, all that performance dissolved away. And I, and I remember thinking in that moment, is this what it's actually about? Like, is this, has it ah. been under my nose the whole time? Right. But of course, not having at that time, any practices to actually grab and hold that moment. I was like, yes. take it off. You gotta go. You gotta go to the test. So I ran <laughs> and, and off I went. And so I haven't literally, oh, I'm getting chills just remembering. Cause I, I have not thought about that moment in probably I don't want to say how many decades, but a while. <laughs> just, um, just a few years. Just a few years. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at the essence of that is just what does it mean to live? What it means to live is to to be present to the beauty that is our existence, mm. right? That is surrounding us, that is innate in us, that is our birthright. It is not something to seek or to earn. It is something to to accept and welcome because it's all around you all the time. And how do you make it good? The second question is, is really how do you, for me, it's more, how do you create some margin in the day to day to allow that beauty in? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the crux of what you and I are up to as, as humans in this show um, is, is how do we for ourselves first and then for others after us just kind of push the push the walls out a little bit to let that wonder in, you know, so that I think is, ah. is how to make it good is just 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 create this the tiniest bit of space for what for that butterfly to land somewhere, you know. Oh, I love that. What I love the most about that is the fact that in that moment you are present, right? And and that's the whole purpose of remembering to live is like, how do we show up to life as it's happening? But we get these little moments, and like you said, then we're just back on the hamster wheel and believing that we have to earn our joy, like that we have to like work really hard and one day we get to live. Instead of realizing like the living's it's happening right now. It's all around us. We have moments throughout the day, all day that we can grasp that wonder. Yeah. And you know, when I, I deeply appreciate the journey of arriving to this type of realization, because I remember, well, 
whenever Oprah used to still be relevant, right? Like more relevant than she is now. And she was on her like gratitude kick, right? Like keep a gratitude mm-hmm. journal, all these things. And that used to piss me off. Cause I'd be like, you know what? No, I do not want to be grateful. I want to be pissed. I want to be angry at all the things that have happened to me, the, all the things I do not have. Like I'm pissed that all these other folks have privileges. I don't have, like I've mm-hmm. had to struggle and da, da, da. And I was so wedded to my Mm. lower vibes. I'll put it that way. Very valid. The feelings, they came from my lived experience, but I had an attachment to them that made it so I didn't even want to, just didn't even want to discuss the possibility of living in that wonder and in that presence, right? Because like I had been wronged or things were not fair. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't realize was in that mode of thinking, I not only made it an external thing that controlled how I felt, but it was up to something external to let me off the hook as well. So Ah. I was always looking outside to get relief. And that's never the way, at least not a sustainable way. Right? Right, right. So I want to dig in a little bit more to like who you are, because you're one of the people I know that's had the most variety and just like lived experience in from your background and who you are and how you grew up to like your education and your humanitarian work, which has allowed you to see this whole full spectrum of lived lives, right? From people in conditions like I probably can't even imagine living in because I haven't been in the trenches all the way to some of the most privileged people. Like you've seen it all and you've been exposed to it all and you've done the work to really get to know what it means to live a life under the whole spectrum of conditions. So I'd love to just kind of dig into that a little bit and how that has helped you on this journey from being that, you know, college kid who found that moment with the butterfly to being the woman you are that does such amazing work in the world to not only continue to grow and evolve your own life, but to create these spaces for others to find and live the lives that they really want to live? Ooh, that's a really, really beautiful question. And yeah, without getting too deep into it, um, I have traveled to almost, just to say I've traveled to almost 30 countries and I've worked with, you know, ministers <laughs> and, you know, high up <laughs> officials all the way down to tribal elders and people at community levels. And so I have seen as many, I think, iterations of a life that someone of my age and um, an access could possibly see. Um, and what what I learned from that and my own experience kind of mirrors that a little bit, right? Like I'm a refugee that had to escape war as a small child and then came to uh, the U.S., didn't speak the language, had a weird name, which in the 80s wasn't cool. Like these days it's cool. It wasn't then. Um, and then have risen <laughs> to become sort of like an international woman of mystery and all the things that I did. But um the connection that I can make between who I've become because of that and who I was in that moment with the butterfly from all this exposure is understanding that fundamentally everybody, no matter what their position or experience in life is, they, we all want the same thing. We want to feel peace. Mm. We want to feel safety. We want to feel joy. And we want to be in loving relationship with each other. And that Mm. across the board Mm -hmm. never, ever changed, no matter where I was or who I was talking to. And the more you kind of go, if you will, down the economic scale to where material privilege is less and less, the more those things become prominent because it is, you are Mm. human in a more raw way when you're in danger the way that people in vulnerable populations are. And there's, there's, um, in no way do I want to romanticize what it means to be poor or disprivileged, mm-hmm. but it, it really focuses your attention on what matters differently. Right. Um, mm. and so I think there's something 
the journey that I've been on over the past few years is really integrating that into my own sense of being a human in terms of empathy and compassion, but also in terms of like letting myself off the hook, right? Like, can yeah. I let myself live? When do I get to, you know, I've been living in service for so long. That's been like the thing, right? For others, for others, for others. Mm -hmm. But it has to start with me. So I think seeing this is you're just understanding how there's, there's, a, there's a fundamental thread that runs through all of us in terms of our experience, no matter what, but it, every single one starts with the individual. I have to be well, and I have to make myself okay in order to be able to radiate in any degree out from there. Yes. Yes. And I think that that carries over into so many areas of life, right? Whether we are wanting to be of service to others through our work or volunteerism, whether we are caretakers or parents or insert responsible for other people in other ways, it all starts with ourself. Like it's so cliche, the whole, when you're on the airplane, put your mask on first, but it's like the realest, truest thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I often, so I tend to work more with women or femme identifying folks for a variety of reasons. First, that was my niche in the humanitarian world. I was working with um, women and girls who were in danger around their um, health, particularly their reproductive health. So it's just a, a very comfortable place for me. But you also realize, mm -hmm. depending on your presentation in the world and your lived experience, you are told certain stories about what you can and cannot do, um, where you can mm -hmm. and cannot be. And part of the work that I'm doing for myself and by extension for everyone I serve is to really interrogate those narratives and say, well, who says, who says I have yes. to be in service in order to enjoy myself or, you know, the order of things. And there's, um, I discovered much, much later in life that I'm actually a body-based person. I thought I was just a brain whose body like was there to carry the brain around, but I'm learning <laughs> yeah. that I, I'm actually much more like about the physical. And um, there's this kind of shape that this contrast in shapes that I present when we talk about, it starts with me first, right? Because putting your mask on and all that, that makes sense. But when you make it physical and raw, you can understand it in a different way. And I want to use it, if I may, um, if you think about the way that often, let's say like, typically women um, mm -hmm. hold things, right? The way we hold things, the, the image I have for that when we don't count ourselves in is, is almost this arching over something, right? So imagine you're like arching ah. your body over a globe. You're like surrounding it with your whole body and holding onto it. But if you actually try to make that shape with your body normally, it's extremely painful. It's uncomfortable. Yes. It's un right? And you can't hold it for very long without consequences. And the shift mm. for me is really to, to switch to this posture where you're actually just fully centered, right? Like aligned and straight physically. And then all you got to do is just lift your arms up. And you could kind of stand mm. like that. If you have good grounding, you could yes. hold something for days, really. But what that comes down to is your wow. core is grounded. You are at the center of the power of things. And that to me is, you know, just a physical and visual way of depicting that difference between what it means to include yourself. It's not saying don't hold things, but you have to first be the thing that is solid before anything else can be done. Mm, I love that. And I love the visual, right? Because we all learn and understand in different ways. One of the things I would love to know is what is one of the things that you've learned from someone who is very different from you? Because you've had, you know, the, and I'll call it a privilege, the privilege of being exposed to a lot of people who aren't like you and a lot of different ways of thinking and being in living. And is there one little nugget that, or one of the many nuggets that's like stuck with you that you are open to receiving that's helped you live a little better? Yeah. You know, I, I want to, <laughs> um, I'm just going to say it because I, I skirt around it often 
because of the climate of the country in which this podcast is primarily um, broadcast. But really, what I worked in for very many years was abortion rights. Um, and people have all kinds of opinions about it. And when you work in that environment, um, you are confronted by people who have a different um, idea of how life should be respected. Um, and I had an mm. experience with someone, uh, if let's say I'm on the pro choice, um, versus pro life, which I think is a terrible distinction. We're all about life. <laughs> like it really is. Yes. It's yes. A woman's. Um, um, yes, we got into, I, I, I was confronted by someone who interestingly was a roommate of mine in college. I hadn't seen her in some years and she didn't know what I was up to. And this was someone, when you say someone who's very different from you, this is someone I thought was like me, but they had never come up, right? This kind of topic hadn't come up. And we, it was five or six years later, I was deep into my work and we met up. We both happened to be in some town and we met up and she knew what I was up to. And she took a moment out of our dinner to tell me how uncomfortable she was with what I was doing, even though it didn't have anything to do with our conversation. There was no reason to bring that up. Um, but she, she, she was like, I just don't agree with what you're doing. I think it's murder. You know, this is her opinion. And in that moment, I felt just this bile, this like hot bile coming up mm. my, my chest. And, and just as I was about to give it to her, <laughs> she says to me, because I really, really believe in the sanctity of life. And she said, the way she said it, the sincerity with which she said it made me realize, hold on a second. So do I, oh my gosh, so do I. Mm. And so I talked to, I, it helped me just kind of pivot a few degrees from where I was before to be able to say to her, I understand what you're saying because I feel that same thing ah. too. I think life is absolutely sacred which is why I don't want anyone to ever have to make that choice. And my work is actually dedicated to ensuring that more women and children live long, healthy, and beautiful lives. And sometimes the circumstances just don't allow for that. And that's when a medical procedure might right. be the best option. And she had never, you know, thought of it that way, but I had never seen her in that way. And it just opened up this new chamber in my heart where I'm like, now I don't, we're not different. We are actually really after the same thing. And I think the climate that yes. we live in, in America now, if we could see that more and more, see in those who disagree with us more of ourselves than we do see differences, it could be the key to unlocking a lot of resolution in our world right now. But it I mean, I can't think of a more sticky topic and a more personal attack than what happened mm -hmm. there, but it's still, we ended up hugging and crying for God's sake. So um, it's just, again, to say uh. that we, we all really do want the same thing, but we just have different ways of arriving there. So we need to make space for everybody's pathways. I love that. And it's so beautiful. And it's such a great example about being open and being open to different ways of thinking. Lots of times we think about it as like being afraid to be around people who might not look or speak like us, but it's, are we open to different ways of thinking and can we actually explore and understand why and find that common thread of connection? Because you're right at the end of the day, we all just want to be able to fully live these lives in a safe and joyful way fully be able to be ourselves and express ourselves in the world in a safe and joyful way. And so many things have prevented that from happening. And if we could all just kind of step back and see how many times we don't even realize we're contributing to that and that we're fed a lot of things mm -hmm. instead of feeling like there's so much of a divide, how can we look for the connection? How can we find those threads that connect us all? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is the question. And I want to bring it back to the, the individual experience of living, because what happens when it's in sort of a relational space, right? Like you can say blue versus red or, you know, pro this, pro that, like there's a way that we can draw contrast 
connect with an other much more easily than we can within ourselves. But there's ways in which we divide against ourselves as well, which is like, in order to, I must. There's an if-then process that we play with ourselves that's very disintegrating because our natural state is as a whole. Our innate being Mm -hmm. is one that is joyful and can experience pain and still come out, you know, whole and not be broken in the ways that we kind of assume ourselves to be. So, so I, what I've enjoyed about the career that I've had and the work that I do is in the reflection of others, I can see the parts of myself that need healing and welcoming, right? If I can do that for Mm -hmm. someone else, can I do that for my parts too? And how would that enable me to just move with more ease in my own life? Yes. Self-exploration. And that's like a lot of what it's about, right? Like this journey of life that we have is exploring ourselves and getting to know ourselves and learning how to be present to these lived experiences that we're going to have good ones. We're going to have bad ones. We're going to have ones that light us up. We're going to have ones that feel like they're destroying us, but all of them add up to a life. They do. They do. And, and yeah, what I want to encourage myself most of all, but anyone that I encounter to, to do is put, put the good stuff on the balance as often as you do the bad stuff. Like there's just a way I feel, yes. uh, and we don't even need to blame systems or media. We, we've, we're indoctrinated. It's in our DNA now, but like, why is it that I always have to think in the more negative terms of things? Like, can I help myself take credit for the good shit too. Like let in, you know, know, back to that angry version of me that was like, F you Oprah and your gratitude journal. Like, no, Mm -hmm. let her, let her be and let her show me, let me be happy that I had a piece of stinky cheese in Paris today. And that's the best thing that happened to me today. Like, why isn't that (laughs) a win? Right. Um, And that's the other thing is we don't count the wins as often. We don't celebrate like celebration. And the more that we've become, um, technified, right? And dispersed and isolated, yes. the further we are from natural rhythms and rituals that enable us to celebrate and be in, in joyous connection where presence resides. So there's a lot of kind of like hearkening back yes. to our roots and our original selves that is as much an internal journey as it is a heritage journey, right? It's an ancestral journey too. There's a lot of mm-hmm. layers don't get me started. I could go on into all kinds of dimensions from here, but there's, there's a lot of reasons why we feel, you know, the way that we do. And it's just not necessary. We have everything within our, um, systems as humans to, to be healed and to be whole. Mm -hmm. And it's just summoning those forward, which is the key. Yeah. And I, I appreciate you saying that in, in thinking about like, what are these things? This is one of the topics I want to dig deeper in. I have a lot of questions about, and so there'll be a lot more discussions on the podcast (laughs) about it, but you know, all of these discussions recently about AI and like all of the changes that are rapidly coming. And I'm actually in a book club and we're reading a book about AI. And I was like at first resistant to it just because I'm trying so hard to really live in my humanness as much as possible. And I started having some of the fears, right? Of like, not the fears where people are saying AI is going to take over all of the jobs and we're not going to be able to get any jobs in, in those types of fears. I started having these fears of what happens when we get further and further away from being human. So even when you look at the positives of all of these technology advances that make things easier, that give us back this time, right? What are we going to fill the time with? Mm -hmm. Are we filling the time with more of the same? Are we just finding other ways to overwork, to stay disconnected, to be in more screens? Are we going to use some of these things to allow us to have more time to be, Mm -hmm. to get back out in nature, to have in real life things, uh, to commune and build community and really improve our lives in a way that allows us to fully live Mm. as humans in our humanness. Mm. 
So I'm really glad that you brought AI up because similarly, or I'd say probably way even more than the average, I'm like self-proclaimed flag flying Luddite, like keep tech out of my life. Like I don't like it. I have social media, all these things. Anyone who knows me knows that I've been like, no, no, no to that kind of stuff for the longest time. Um, simply because of the mental health implications that it has for me particularly, mm-hmm. but I know how having worked with adolescents, I know kind of the damage that it can do to like fragile brains. Um, and I'm not neurotypical either. So I have to be careful about what I consume and how, but recently in the sort of humanitarian work that I've been doing, AI is front and center because it is presenting mm-hmm. itself as a tool to enable, to scale service in different ways to different people. And I've been in debates with folks who, whose job it is to worry about what's going to happen to societies with the introduction of this new advanced technology that, that is moving at such a rapid pace. We don't even, we can no yes. longer predict it, right? Like all of our predictive models right are already wrong (laughs) based on how quickly like generative AI is moving. But um, I was saying to someone recently that I will, I always have been, and I always will be a stand for hope in the world. I do not care. You cannot convince me that there is not Mm -hmm. a brighter day tomorrow. I don't care what you show me. And there's a lot of reasons not to feel that way, especially today. But they're really not that different than the reasons from yes. yesterday mm-hmm. or the reasons from tomorrow. It's how we engage and how we mm-hmm. shut down in the face of them that matters. But for me, I think what AI is going to do to our society that is very, very different from any technology that has come before is it's almost going to accelerate this question of the utility. And I use that word in quotes, the utility of humans, because up until now, we have been used mm-hmm. as products to create other products, right? We have been the Mm. robots, if you will, right? Um, And I think that the advent of AI will eventually take us to a place where this separation between the haves and have-nots will become so stark, we'll have no choice but to rebalance things from a resource perspective Mm -hmm. in order for the race to survive. And in that rebalancing, things like universal basic income will come into being. Um, education for all will come into being access to all kinds of things that currently people don't have will come into being. I am looking forward to the surprise on people's faces when they see that AI actually will become a democratizing tool. And most of all, Mm. what it will do is liberate us from doing that rote work that does not inspire because inside every human, and I know this because I've met them all. (laughs) I have been everywhere and I've met all of them. Um, There is a creator, right? There is Mm. a creator that wants to dance or draw or tell a story or sing or track the stars or do something. Every single one of us, no matter our education, no matter anything, we are Mm. creators. And so I believe that kind of punting the boring stuff to AI will open up this whole new era of us seeing ourselves as creators. And we've never lived in a society like that before. I mean, not in the modern times we know of. If you watch Ancient Aliens, then you might yes. believe that that used to exist. <laughs> I love Ancient Aliens. But, um, Me too. But yeah, so, yeah, oh my gosh. Sisters. Um, yeah. So yeah. So for me, it's like I'm really, I've really come around to AI from that place of being a humanitarian because the potential is so huge. And the other thing I want to say is people like you and people like me, it's actually incumbent upon us to master these technologies so that they are not only ruled by the people who have created the things we already don't like. Right. So it's like, yes. let me, <laughs> let me understand how to wield this massive tool for good. So yes, and and we live in a day and age where the positive is we have access to learn it where in the past as a average everyday human we didn't necessarily have access to learn about and touch and feel and discover and master these technologies when they were coming out, you know, we had to wait until they were at a point where we were allowed to experience Mm -hmm. them. But with our access and what the internet has done over the last several decades, like we can all, 
learn it. And so as, as these new things come out, instead of being afraid of them, like you said, how do we learn how to embrace it and see how it can be a tool for good? Yeah. Because the more that we lean into as humans being tools for good, then all of these things that we're creating will also become tools for good. Yeah, definitely. And I want to, I want to bring it back to, um, adolescents because I love them. And I want to talk about what becomes possible when the old ways kind of fall away. So one of the things people mm. always rag on Gen Z, poor, poor things as being lazy and being this, that, and the other. <laughs> the fact is Gen Z's were born into a world that looks nothing like the world that you and I went into in terms of the labor market and things, and yes. they just cannot, and they don't want to participate in the way that the boomers mm -hmm. on down to like Gen X and such did. and you know, one way of looking at that is to be like, well, they're lazy or, you know, whatever they lack discipline, but by not engaging in the market economy or the labor economy, the way we did, what they have that we don't is this immense emotional language. They understand mm -hmm. and explore their interior space in ways that we were never allowed to do because we were on the wheel already. Right. But by the time they got around to it, we mm -hmm. broke that wheel. It, it's, it's ruined. It's creaky. It's missing parts. <laughs> and they're just opting out. But I want to say that, like, we aren't appreciating enough what is flourishing in the place of what we were forced to do that they no longer can do. And that's, that's an analog example of what AI might do for us yes. is when we no longer have to, like, memorize or, or do those sort of basic yes. things. What will we come up with? Like our imaginations are going to just flourish. And I'm really excited to see what we create. I love that. My children are my greatest teachers in life at this point. Watching them navigate their lives and doing it so different, so different than like we did coming up. And like my daughter, she is in the corporate world, but she's just navigating it so differently. And she is fully in control of how she wants to live, fully in control of the work that she wants to do. Wants to do. She's very successful. And she just knows, like, she, she's not, she doesn't feel like I should just be grateful to get a job. She knows they should be grateful to have me and knows her value and knows her worth. And then my son, who's still in college and has absolutely not a, inkling of getting a traditional climb the ladder type of job like at all and he goes to a prestigious school and that's kind of like an annoyance to him that he's even in school because he happened to be one of those pandemic kids that missed his whole senior year of high school he missed all of the milestones and spent it at home he missed his whole freshman year of college but it showed him what was so broken with the system like when I asked him after high school, like, well, what do you, how do you feel? You know, you missed that year and I'm so sad. And, you know, I was more sad for like the milestones and just the little like rites of passage of life that we, we all are accustomed to if you came up in that world. And his words to quote him was, mom, I realized high school was trash. And I said, <laughs> well, explain. Well, <laughs> <laughs> explain son what does that mean and he was like they ha they had us go sit there all day when the actual work that we were supposed to do i got done in like two hours and i could spend the rest of the day doing all the things i actually want to do and he's yes. taken that wisdom and that learning he can't unlearn that he can't unsee that mm -hmm. and so he's just living his life different so i have that like real life tangible example and my son, and I just have to learn from him and like allow him to show me a new way. And to bring it back to sort of the entire premise, it, that is how to live. It is to actually have the capacity yes. to look at something and say, is this for me or isn't it? So there's a way that because of extreme circumstances, um, the younger generations have had to confront their realities differently and more in more quickly in some ways than we had to. Mm -hmm. And within that is a different kind of agency, a different kind of knowing, and I think a different um, urgency around living their truth. And, you know, they, they use this language all the time, which I think people of a um, a certain age and above scoff at because we were taught that you don't get to have that. 
that's not okay to have. You have to earn it. You know, you don't get to like relax and know yourself yeah. and explore yourself until after you've retired, for example, or whatever. It, we were in, under such a productivity model of existence that is now disintegrating for a various number of reasons. And, and these kids mm -hmm. are just like clocking it. <laughs> And they're showing us a whole different way that we can be. And and you're right. It is upon us to revere them as teachers as much as we demand they follow what we teach them. Right? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. I love talking to you. I knew that we would, <laughs> we would naturally navigate to all of the things. I do have to just circle back and say that for many years of my life, Friday night was my ancient aliens binge. Oh! So I'm <laughs> what I what I love about our friendship is it is just full of surprises. Like I think I know, and then every time we talk, I'm like, damn, and she loves ancient aliens. Gosh, it's like <laughs> it's a dream. It's a dream. But that's just it. It's like, okay, let's I'm gonna talk for one second about ancient aliens. And and I'm gonna make it make sense <laughs> in the context of what we're talking about, really. What is ancient aliens? Okay, first of all, all the people who are the experts on ancient aliens are kooky. Love them. Like, you know, I watch them. I'm like, dude, just take your crystal off and brush your hair and people will take you more seriously. I understand, you know, like all of this, but you've got to love them because they are so passionate about their beliefs in these, mm -hmm. these creatures that had a different kind of knowledge and might have come from outer space and blah, 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 that we have been told are actually, you know, Egyptian ruins or whatnot. Who cares what's true or what isn't? But watching the experts in that show is why I watch it because they're so, they have let themselves follow that fantasy and that dream mm. and made a life out of it. They're on TV. I'm not. So like they are, and they're providing entertainment and, and information of a different stripe to a bunch of people. And that, what I love about that show, aside from I'm totally into like alien conspiracies is it is an example of another way that we can live in this exact same moment with all the things we have been told we are and are not and make our own decision right? Make our own choice about yes. that. And that's what it means to live is to say, okay, I'm going to take all this stuff you gave me. I'm going to sit with it. I'm going to simmer with it. And then I'll tell you what makes sense for me and what doesn't make sense for me. And that is living for me. That is the essence of it. Yes. Yes. And you get to watch people who get to use their imagination and their curiosity and explore things that interest them. And so many of us put those things on the shelf. And it's like a one, well, someday I'll, someday I'm going to study this. Someday I'm going to try this hobby. Someday I'm going to go see this wonder and experience this thing. And eventually the some days turn into too late. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I want to be sensitive to whoever is listening who might not be in the right frame of mind. So I'm going to offer a tiny trigger warning here that I'm going to mm -hmm. talk about what it actually means to be a human organism. The fact is, there is an end. And mm -hmm. um, to come back to this topic of ritual and natural rhythms, we're so segregated from that part of ourselves that we forget there is a limit yes. to the time that we have. And so we are not behaving as though we will die. When <laughs> really, we should know that. And, but we should embrace mm -hmm. that as a beautiful permission to do the things we want to do sooner rather than later. Because I know you and the work yes. that you have done and certainly me and the work I have done, I have seen lives come to an end mm -hmm. right before my eyes. Um, and it is as resilient as it is precious to be a human. Uh, and if we could just understand that about ourselves and accept that aspect of the human experience, the fact that it does end, I think it would open up so many new possibilities for living an authentic life for those of us who feel like if only I, <laughs> if I could just, if yes. I could just you know, but it's, yes. not, it's not easy. And thank you for adding taught. that. Yeah. We're not taught that we're not, it doesn't, it doesn't get talked no. about, especially not in like my family, not in my community, nowhere where I grew up was that a topic. It was very taboo. And that's, it's limiting. I think it's yeah. limiting to our ability to live, not to talk about the fact that we will die. Agreed. And like the one thing that we all know is 
it's something we will all experience. None of us know our timeline. But even if we are blessed to live a long, long life, so many people end up with regrets. And that's why I want people to remember to live right now in this moment that we know we have. It feels to me, if I may, and please feel free to edit this out, but if I feel it's taken on a newfound meaning, even in your own life with what's been happening with your mother, right? Like you're seeing mm-hmm. it in real time. Yes. And I just want to, this is between you and me here, really human to human. I want to appreciate how alive mm-hmm. that topic is for you. And I'm just so um, proud of the way that you are seizing your day. You know, you're like, oh. fuck it. I want to be a writer. I want to be mm-hmm. a podcast. You're doing it. And I see you do it every day. Um, you're showing up for yourself. And there's something so inspiring about that. I want you to know that every time I open my LinkedIn, it's only to see what you have posted. And every day I'm like, oh. there she is again. Like, I'm so happy. And you make me want to do that even more for myself, whatever that version is for me. It's super inspiring. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for being one of the lights along my journey. But it is. I, my father passed when I was a child. So I learned at an early age that like life isn't promised. But watching my mother, who's made it to her 80s, have all these regrets and all these things that she, I know she wanted to do and experiences she wanted to have, but she was either too afraid or didn't see a way and just it didn't happen. And now she can. And that does infuse my desire to wake up and live fully every day. It infuses my desire to create as many opportunities and experiences and reminders and inspiration for all of us to show up to our lives and live them fully and to connect with each other and help each other on this journey because there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be good days. There's going to be bad days, but what a joy to be able to experience it all. Absolutely. And I, I want to say that, you know, at the top, you said, I've, I've lived many lives. This is true. And I've lived many traumas, also true. And many tragedies, also true. And um, I'm finally at a place where I can be super thankful for them all because they have not only made me the person I am today, who I love. I think she's great. Um, but Ooh, they've I also- do too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but they've they've in the light of those experiences, I can savor the richness of, of the good moments, if you will, with such more depth mm. and appreciation than I ever did, because I know what it's like to not want to get out of bed. I know what it's like not to know if there is going to be a tomorrow and that's on me, right? That's a choice that I might mm-hmm. have made. Um, and so I think getting to a place of gratitude for every experience and what it has to bring to us then makes it more possible to to move with ease through every day, even when it didn't pan out the way you had planned or hoped that it would, right? Yes. Mm. <laughs> oh, I think gratitude is the perfect button for this conversation. But I do have three quick questions to ask as we wrap up. Yeah. Right now, I'd love to know what gets you excited? Ooh, okay. So I... What gets me excited right now is um, reconvening and breathing new life into the community that I created a couple of years ago that's called Coven. And it's a a collective movement for women to be able to live more freely and more in their truth in various ways. And I had to go through, I had to put it on pause and go through everything I went through for a year to learn the lessons, to be able to hold it in the way she deserves. Right. And by she, I mean any woman who comes into that space. So I'm excited every day to wake up and think, how can I serve myself and my joy and through that serve others? Like this is a whole new orientation of life for me. And I'm excited to play in that space now for sure. Oh, oh, I love it. And having had experienced, um, a coven event and have experienced the community, I am very excited to see and witness and be a part of all of the amazing things that coven is going to 
birth into this world. Thank you. And I think my, my final question is, what are, or what, maybe there's one, or maybe there's a couple, what are the little things that you do each day to help you remember to live? Oh, this is such a timely question because I grew up in a hectic immigrant household with two working parents that had to leave at early hours and then and and I fended for myself a lot. And what doesn't happen when you live a life like that typically is you don't have routine and structure in your life. And at the ripe old age of I look better than I younger than I am, <laughs> that's all I'll say. No, I'm going to be 44 this year. And this, what I have done is finally instituted a morning routine, which sounds so ridiculous, but has changed my life. And what it is, is in any duration or shape, the first thing I do when I wake up is movement, meditation, and reflection. So that might be like a seven minute butt workout or an hour and a half of yoga. It might be five Mm -hmm. minutes listening to some Abraham Hicks or like an hour meditation, you know, whatever. But just starting the day like that is okay. I have a body, I have a mind and I have a soul. And then I'll move into whatever is going on out there. And that is the way I live, truly live. Yes. Yes. And that is... Carol, you are speaking my language. It is what I (laughs) preach every day. Make sure you have your sacred brackets in place. When you first wake up and before you go to bed, make those times about you. Mm. So my friend, let's let the people know how they could get in touch with you, what you have going on, what you'd like to share. Yeah. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is whether or not whatever I'm quote doing out in the world. If anything I have said resonates and you just want to chat, please come find me. Um, The easiest way to find me is through my website, which is covencollective.com and coven is spelled C-O-V-N collective.com. Please just reach out to me there or through Kareen or however you can get to me. I'm always so eager to meet people who are like-minded, who are interested in the same kind of movements that you and I are. Um, let's just have a chat. But if anything I've said has sparked an interest in you, especially if you're femme identifying to learn and grow new things, then absolutely please come join my community. We are, we have a lot of fun plans in place for growing this year and great um, content, great events, great get togethers. And I just, I just, want to have this big celebratory party with as many like, like-minded women as possible. So please come join us. We, I promise <laughs> you will not regret it. I promise. Awesome. Thank you again for being here. I love you so much. Thank you. Love you too. What a privilege. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned something, laughed a little, and were inspired to remember to live. Share that nugget and this podcast with a friend to inspire them too. And don't forget to like and subscribe so we can all help each other life better.